Okay, welcome everyone for another edition of Drunk Agile. Uh, with us as always is our, our mascot and yeah. the star of the show, Nisha, if you haven't checked out the show. Um, most people tune in just to see Nisha, um, as do we. And with me as always is... Pratik Singh. So um, Pratik, what are we talking tonight? Can you, uh, can you introduce tonight's topic? Yeah, um, we actually thought long and hard about this as to what should we do when we, when we do this live. And came up with nothing. <laughs> so we're here, we have some ideas, but we are here to talk about whatever you all want to talk about. So throw things at us, and we'll try to throw them back, as, except for the whiskey. As, as, as Jose said, the more pr provocative, the better. So um, everybody's drinking. I hope everybody's drinking. Um, these conversations are always better with alcohol. So let's, uh, let's, see, let's see what damage we can do. So there was a football. Uh, well, it was two football matches that took place yesterday. Oh. <laughs> it was, uh, uh, and, uh, and, and you're probably like familiar with the results and the outcomes, right? So, we're talking about forecasting probability ranges. Like, can you can you talk about Liverpool a little bit? <laughs> <laughs> Next, <laughs> is this a safe space? Yeah. We don't. <laughs> nope. We don't. <laughs> no, we don't. We don't. We don't. We don't talk about English football. We only talk about Italian football. So if anybody wants to add, we'll talk about the European Championships from last year, we. Do you want? You want to talk about the World Cup? Uh, no, no, I don't want to talk. About that. I mean, okay, next one. But, Come Here's question. Well, we could uh, let's 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 uh, I'll I'll generalize it as opposed to going particular, right? Whenever you're going into any kind of forecast, um, especially sports, uh, you have some sort of an idea of what's going to happen, so you, which is usually based on past performance. So you're going, if I run, if, I, if this game gets played a thousand times, what do we expect will happen? That's probably where you start. And that's exactly how we like to predict things, which is Monte Carlo simulations, run the same game a thousand times, and see what happens. Um, when you all go to your favorite betting sites, that's exactly what they're doing. They're trying to figure out if we played this game a thousand times, what would happen. But what's more interesting uh, is as the game progresses and we see the number of shots on goal, we see um, how the, the percentage of possession and especially when there's a goal scored, uh, you change, change the probability of it and you come up with a new prediction. In fact, I remember the last World Cup, they were presenting the probabilities of every game increase, uh, and putting it out live. Um, and I believe that's what Dan is picked, pulling up right now, how those probabilities change as the game progresses. Um, you're pulling up the Belgium game? I am. There we go. You want to talk football? We can talk about football. <laughs> I don't know if everybody, if everybody sees that. Let me make that that. Beautiful. Anna Pratik, you want to talk through that? Yeah. Um, this was Belgium and Japan. And I think coming in, if you look at it, it's about, what's the 33, 20% 20, 20 chance that Japan wins that game. But as the game progresses, you can see that chances are declining a little bit. Less time left. Obviously, the, the, the more powerful team is more likely to win. But what happens at a, just right after halftime? Japan scores, which means our prior simulations do not hold because we have new information. And now that we have new information, let's run the simulations with new information. And then about 10 minutes, five minutes after that, we have more new information. And you can see how those probabilities changed as we moved forward. As, as, and, and I am sure yesterday, if we were running these simulations over and over again, we would have seen these probabilities change over and over again. Um, I don't know if I want to say anything about Liverpool. I'm not going to. <laughs> but I mean, I mean the, the, but the parallel to what, hopefully, what all of you encounter is, uh, how many of you do some type of up, upfront release planning or project planning or whatever planning? Dare I say PI planning, take a drink. Um. <laughs> I was just going to ask, what is the good about, uh, part about safe? I, maybe I just want to <laughs> see you drink, but. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. But I mean, I mean, but, 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 but so think about, think about the up, upfront planning that you do. Do, do, those, do those plans ever change? I mean, do you ever go back and change the plan that you made? They're um, useless, so like, why, why go back? To it, it, <laughs> I mean, I'll be honest, with you, I, I really don't know. I, I cannot speak intelligently about SAFE, um, so I, I, I can't get into that, but yeah, I don't. <laughs> I don't, I don't know anything. Uh, I really don't know anything about SAFE, but um, I, know, I know about a thing called PI planning, and I know that, that take a drink. Um, but do, does that plan, I don't know, does that plan get updated after you come out of that meeting? Does that plan get updated? When, when Japan scores a goal, does that plan get updated? When Belgium scores a goal, does that plan get updated? And this is, this is what we're talking about. We, we always try to get this, uh, this Twitter hashtag trending. Uh, please help us out. It's, uh, it's called continuous forecasting, and this is this, this concept of, of continuous forecasting is as you're doing your work, I mean, the upfront plan is all well and good, but as you're doing your work, you're getting much, much more information. And it's, it's, it's silly to the point of being ridiculous to not consider how you might incorporate that, um, that new information into your plan and rerun the plan. If Japan goes up 2 nil on Belgium, their chances of winning the game have fundamentally changed. Something provocative. We need, we need, we need more provocative. Hi, folks. Um, whoops, quick. Um, question for me: When will you have a conversation with um, Craig Larman about single backlogs? And I want to see if you guys uh, have a conversation about um, what is the benefits of having a single backlog in your in your minds in organisations. Hmm, if only Pratik was doing something like this right now in his. Yeah, uh, um, the pra practical experience from, from past few months, um, the, the company I'm working with right now, we literally took the six different backlogs that the teams had and made it one unified backlog. And if you were in Colleen's talk earlier, we started using a portfolio Kanban board for the teams to pull their own work to say, OK, this is the next thing available. Let's pull this forward. The problem we saw was we have six teams, six backlogs, which means six priorities. And you would inevitably have one team working on the lowest priority work for the entire organization. And we went to this at the feature or the epic level. We did not go to it at the story level. I think that might be too disruptive. But if someone tries that, please let me know. But yeah, we realized very quickly that uh, team, team five had all their highest priority features as the lowest priority features for the entire organization. So, but, help me out. Is, is Craig Larman for or against a single backlog? He's for it, and he gave me some convincing arguments. But I was, I was curious to know what you spark folks when you had a conversation with him. Oh, no, yeah, no. He, he, just, he just stole everything that we, yeah. that we came up with. And also, every time someone calls us smart, we drink. Yeah. <laughs> I think I'm like three drinks behind, but. Uh, <laughs> So how do you forecast uh, the value of something? <laughs> uh, Is this where we invite Carl up on the stage? It, it, might, it might be. Um, uh, how many, let's, let's put it out to you. How, how many people out there prioritize their backlogs based on value? Admitted. Nobody, nobody wants to put their hands up because they're afraid yeah. to get called. I promise I nothing. Value. What's that? Value. Exactly, yeah. exactly. That, that's a great question to find value. I don't know how you define value. I don't know, JP, how you would define value, but does, does anybody even have an ordered backlog? Let's, let's the, all you scrum folks out there, do you have an ordered backlog? Um, even, even, if, even if we're not talking about value. Pratik, what, what do you think about ordering a backlog by value or, or any other? This is a take a drink moment, but I won't. Um, <laughs> The, 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 the whole point of ordering a backlog is saying that we're going to do things in some order, <laughs> in, some, in some sort of priority, um, which is assuming at least three things. One is that our ordering method is actually correct. We have a, we have a good idea of value, so we're able to order it. Two is these things will not grow to great sizes and will not split. 
And the third, the probably the most important one that everyone forgets, is that nothing new is going to show up. How many times have we ordered a backlog and the next day or the same day, something new has shown up that is of higher priority? Yeah. But if you're doing forecasting continuously, why, do our, why don't you, why, why won't you do prioritizing? And actually, that's exactly what we talked about. Um, that's, that's the whole point of, of a, of a just-in-time, the, the flip side, the other half of a just-in-time commitment, and if, if you didn't go to Colleen's talk this morning, shame on all of you who did not go, um, where she talked about just-in-time commitment, but the flip side of the just-in-time commitment, or I shouldn't say the flip side, the same side um, of just-in-time commitment, is just-in-time prioritization. By pulling these things in just-in-time, not only are you committing just-in-time, but you're prioritizing uh, just-in-time as well. Only when we have a signal that we have capacity to do work should we have a conversation about, okay, what's the next most important thing to do? In my not so humble opinion, right? That, that's the time to have that conversation. You know, spending, spending countless you know, hours or days or whatever ordering a backlog based on uh, uh, you know, an arbitrarily per perceived notion of value or some other type of metric uh, from a lean perspective is, is waste because we know, we know it's gonna change. We, as a rule, we don't answer questions from Dutch people. So. Uh, I just want to add something. It means if you order a backlog, you also have to have the option that something is falling out at the end, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. You can take in something new. And we, yeah. we see that we don't have that option many times. Yeah. They just push in something new, but it seems like, you know, it's what I learned about it. It's like a taco, right? It's uh, too far. Yeah. For it's, a, it's a taco, right? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, as soon as you order a backlog, you've kind of make a, made a commitment on something you haven't yet picked up. Yeah. So, and there's, there's yeah, uh, we, we, we talk, uh, if we, I don't know if we, I think we've done an episode on this. Uh, and this whole idea of, of ex ante versus ex post, and there's so much in, in Agile that assumes you have information before you start work when you don't. You think that you do, uh, but you don't have that information. The only time you really get that information is when you finish the work. Um, How many people do you think actually check that information and loop it back into their decision making? Great question. I don't know if everybody heard that, but the you know how many people actually validate once we've finished the work? Do we validate that what we put out there was was actually valuable and and have that feed in to uh, what we're working on? I guess we'll go to Will in the back there. Yeah. Okay, we go. Or, or do or, or, sorry, did you have uh, sorry? Yeah. Okay, good. Not Will. Yeah, just a quick one. Uh, I know we, uh, we value like uh, flow metrics, like web aging and throughput and all of these things to help us, you know, with forecasting. I'm um, just curious about your thoughts on DORA metrics and how, if there are any parallels, how do those feed into that as well? Um, DORA metrics are, in my opinion, half of them are flow metrics, actually just by another name, and the other half are balancing quality metrics, which, you know, yeah, sure, you can have great cycle time and put things out every couple of hours, but if you're taking production down every time you're putting something out, um, you're probably not delivering quality product. So I do think Dora metrics help balance it out. I don't think they fully replace flow metrics. My, my only problem with Dora metrics, I don't know if anybody else has this problem, but when, when you hear Dora metrics, do you expect the D-O-R-A to stand for something? Yeah, no. Don't you expect it to be an, an acronym? Yeah. And it, it's not, right? I, I, I don't know for, because I only really heard about this about last, last month, I think it was last month, so, you know, but. Or at least a backpack. Yeah. DevOps research assessment. Yeah. DevOps research assessment. Yeah, but, yeah. Um, so what do you say to some folks that think that Dora metrics are the end all? For example, they may think that flow is cool, but it's all about Dora metrics, especially when you're talking to like DevOps engineers and you're trying to get them on the, you know, on, on the flow uh, uh, train, if, if, if I could use that term. Me? Um, we're, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to be, I'm going to be very predictable here. Uh, but from, from a, from a Kanban flow perspective, um, you know, we're, we're very conscious about the minimum metrics that, that you need to track for your system. And we're actually very transparent about the, the, the notion of the, the metrics that we say you should track are the absolute bare minimum that you should be tracking. In your context, you almost certainly will need other metrics than those. But the reason that we love the metrics that we talk about 
from a Kanban perspective is because those metrics are in the language of the customer. Right? We, 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 we purposely define all of our metrics from the perspective uh, you know, of the customer. So I don't think it's necessarily um, flow metrics versus door metrics. I, I personally think it's, uh, there are certain questions, there are certain questions that your customers are going to ask you that you need to be prepared to answer that I think the flow metrics set you up very well to be able to answer those questions. Uh, there are other metrics that you might care about from a, from a performance and from a improvement perspective that, uh, that maybe Dora helps out with. Um, but for me, if I'm talking to customers, I would never want to go in a conversation with a, with a customer without at least understanding th those four basic flow metrics that, that we talk about. So um, reflecting on what you, when you talk about planning and when you talk about continuous forecasting, um, I'm, I'm reflecting on um, Professor Stanley's, uh, or sorry, Stacy's work um, where he looked into, well, the reason businesses plan has very little to do with actually running the business and is mainly a political process. So when we talk about these things, aren't we missing the point of why planning is happening, right? We're, we're, we're reflecting on what they say they want, but that's not actually why planning is happening. So I'm kind of curious as to your thoughts on this, on how we tackle the political process that underlies this. Yeah, wasn't, wasn't it Eisenhower? Eisenhower said... Um, planning is important, the plan isn't, or, or something like that. It wasn't, was that Eisenhower? Somebody correct me. Every American I'm, in it I'm six, six drinks in, so I don't, you know, I don't know. Um, I mean, honestly, what did Dwight ever do? He just, he won a world war. I mean, really. Uh, I mean, I, 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 I personally kind of beg to differ with, with Dwight. I don't, I don't, I don't know that that always seems like a weak justification. I'm, I'm, I'm going to go. I'm going to go there. I'm going to go there. It always seems a weak justification to me when people say, "Well, you know, it's all about the conversation, right?" Like, like this is a big justification for story points. Well, you know, the story point doesn't matter. It's all about the conversation, and I just, I just think that for me, that's a cop out. That's a complete cop out because all kinds of bad things happen once you open the door to things like story points or, or some of these other things. So I'm personally, and I should, I should follow that up with, if you, what you really care about is the conversation, I think there are much more effective ways to come, out, come, come about that, that conversation other than formal planning meetings, other than things like story points. Um, but, but again, again, that's me. So I don't know. I, like I said, what, what did Dwight ever do for us, really? Hi, I, I've got a question around story points. Which is I don't know. I did it. I did it. I did it. That was my fault. That was my fault. That was totally my fault. <laughs> I mean, if you if you have right sizing and cycle time and it's all predictable, then why why do we need story points at all? You, I think you answered your own question. Yeah, you, you don't. <laughs> if I could if I could wind back time twenty years and never have story points, you know get loosed upon the world, then, then I would. I, yeah. I, I really do think they're the single most evil thing that have ever gotten associated with Agile. And, and I, I think most, most I, I mean people, it, seriously. yeah, most people do story points because people do story points. There, there, is, there is no other problem in the world that when we go and ask, hey, can you solve this? Go, 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 go to your mechanic. Hey, my car's not working. Like, three story points. There's no other problem in the world where someone gives you an answer in story points. What, what about the story points with um, um, decimal points? Because <laughs> yeah. that's, that's the problem we needed to solve, right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Hi. Um, so my question is, you've told us lots of things we shouldn't do, like planning and having product backlogs and story points. What should we do? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It's so much easier. It's so much, yeah, it's so much easier to say not what to do. Do you want to go? Yeah. Okay, go. I, I have only one thing that I would, if, if there was one thing everyone did, there's just one single thing. Watch the aging of your work items. That's the only thing you need to do. How old are the atom, items that we picked up but we haven't finished? And control that. To control that, once you start watching aging, what happens is, you, you get people to come around and actually solve problems together. This thing is getting too old. Our customers waiting for this. Let's get this done. It, there's the people aspect of it. The second part of it is your cycle times start coming down. 
So there's a commitment access, uh, aspect of it, which says, hey, we get things done in five days or less. Great. We can actually talk to customers in their language now that we can get things done in five days or less. The, the people aspect, the process aspect, and the product aspects of it, which is we're getting faster feedback because we're getting things out quickly. We're actually finding out, are we doing the right things? We're actually talking to our customers more often. So to me, almost all software development falls into people, process, and product. And watching age of, of your items and trying to control that, I think, solves all three. If it's that old, do you even need to get it done? Exactly. That, that's a legitimate question that you should be asking. Okay. Absolutely. Yep. No, no doubt. Um, the, one thing, the one thing I would add to Pratik, because of course you know, he, misses, he misses a lot of things when, when he talks. Um, the one thing I would add about aging is pretty much, uh, from, again, from a Kanban flow perspective, pretty much all the, the practices in Kanban that we talk about can be derived from the single practice of watching aging. Some of you have probably seen our episode on this, but uh, this is one question I'd love to ask in my workshop. What, what are the two best things that you can do to prevent an item from aging arbitrarily? There are, there are two things you can do to prevent items from aging arbitrarily. Don't accept if it does not add value. Don't, don't start it is number one. If you don't start it, it's not going to age. And so that was the same thing I think that you were saying. Yeah, don't, don't accept don't, it if it doesn't add value. So don't start it. Yeah. What's the other thing? Finish, Finish it. it. So if you're finishing items and you're not starting items, that's controlling work in progress. Right? How do we know how things are aging? Well, that's visualization. How do we know how much age is too much age? Well, that's, that gets into this probabilistic forecasting that we talk about. All the Kanban practices can be derived from that single notion of just pay attention to age. If you, if you want to optimize flow, your biggest bang for the buck by far, by far, is going to be to pay attention to aging. Um. <laughs> you, you asked for provocative questions, so this is the most provocative one I could think of. Um, as, as agilists or change agents, we're, um, our, our stated aims are to help our clients, our customers succeed at their outcomes, and yet um, there's a kind of uh, unspoken incentive for us to package and repackage our tools in ways that are as monetizable as possible. Um, do you perceive this as a conflict, and if so, how should we manage it? I don't answer hard questions. So. <laughs> That's when he looks at me. Uh, yeah, I, I, I totally perceive this as a conflict. And, and, and it's a conflict at multiple levels. And the deeper you go with it, you end up with safe. Take a drink. Um, but it's, it's, it's a matter of, oh, sorry. I was almost out. <laughs> Thank you. He's cheating. He cheats. He, I, I took a whole, drink. The only reason you cheat is to win. Um, so. Absolutely. The, the, the deeper that conflict runs, the more you get complicated and increasingly complex things. Um, and that's kind of why I like the whole idea of aging. Again, bringing it back to that is what I want my customers to do is as quickly as possible find out if they're delivering value. And it's one metric to rule them all instead of you know the big diagrams that you see. So yeah, absolutely, it is a conflict. And, Simplif simplification is much better than complicating things, generally. So I was going to go back to the previous point we were discussing. And I think it's the third one, not just the two. So we said, don't start, or if you start, finish. But what about the stuff you do start and then realize yeah. that actually it's not, and then you have to change tact? So you should just stop as well. Yeah. yeah. I think. Yes. Cool. Perfect. There you go. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're, we're lumping canceling in with finish. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hi. Please, yeah. Um, I think you're pretty much preaching to the converted here, where you're talking about reducing cycle time and, and keeping things short. I wish I'd said How do you persuade other members of your organization who don't fully understand and believe in flow to keep things small? How do you persuade them? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to steal Pratik's language here. Um, but um, I, I, think, I think Pratik would say, because I don't know, I can, I can never find him to, to ask him um, you know, what, what he really thinks about this stuff. But I think he would say to me, all, all of Agile boils down to finding out how wrong you are as quickly as possible. 
So from a business perspective, we're making a lot of investment you know, in, in what we choose to work on and how long it takes us to work on and whatever. I mean, th th those, are all, those are all investments. And um, we all know from a probabilistic perspective, chances are we're actually wrong. What we choose to work on is probably not valuable. Um, so we need to understand how wrong we are as quickly as possible. And to me, that's, that's probably how I, I would, um, uh, you know, I, I would talk to other people about it, especially kind of more at the sea level. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not sexy, but if you can couch it in terms of like risk management, because that, that's, that's really what we're talking about, is uh, the last thing we want to do is, uh, is work on something, or spend a lot of money on something that, that, that's not valuable. So if, if the odds are not on our side, then we need to learn to, to bail as quickly as possible. I think um, Annie Duke has a new book coming up, if it's not out yet, called Quit, Quit. that I think is, is about that exactly. I, I haven't read it yet, because you know, she, she calls me up for, you know, for, for tips about, about her books. But um, I, I, I think it's, it's all about that, no, no, knowing when to, to, to get out. Um, is it mine? Um, Canadians, we don't, we don't. Yeah, I know. You so Dutch, to... Dutch people and Canadians, I think. You We're want... probably going to put South Africans on the list, too. Then. <laughs> you want to commercial, so I'm going to throw this one at you. Um, uh, one of the practices you talk about, one of the things that are important is visualizing work. We're in an environment now where accessibility is really, really important. And I'm wondering about the worry you may have about excluding people because of the language that we use. We had, a, we had a long conversation about this yesterday, as a, as a matter of fact. Um, the, the, the idea that we, we have to, again, from a Kanban perspective, that you have to visualize your work, um, I think is exclusive language. It is exclusive language. It's not inclusive language. Uh, so we were, we were tossing around a, a lot of, and, and actually, you could, be, you could be our first test audience. You know, t tell us what you think about this. Because we're, we're thinking about from the guide, um, and, and John Coleman is sitting here too, so you know, please, please hit him up with, with any of our ideas. Um, we're thinking about dropping the term visualization or visualize or whatever um, and replacing it with something like, uh, you know, conceptualize or, you know, or, or, you know, or, 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 or sorry, what? Model. Or model or co coming up with a conceptual model. Um, because we don't care whether it's a visual model, it could be an audible model, it could be a whatever kind of model. We don't necessarily care. Uh, the idea is that there's some way to bring about some, some shared understanding and engage different parts of your brain uh, to solve these problems. So I don't know, what, what all of you think? I mean, I, I, uh, I, I, the, the term visualization that hasn't really sat right with me for a while, but what, I don't know, can anybody think of a better word than conceptualization? And we'll give you attribution in the Kanban guide, by the way, if anybody wants to. Reveal. Reveal. Hmm. Reveal's good. Unveil, expose. expose. Those are all good. Yeah. You, John, you taking notes? <laughs> <laughs> those are all those. We need, so, un, we need we need the names of these people just in case. So yeah, we're, we'll have to get your names. Um, but so so conceptualize is not that doesn't work for you? Is that not? No. No. What Do I understand? Find out that model works. What about just model? What about just model? Like you wanna, yeah. Model. Yeah. Reveal. Hmm. Thinking about you know saying you can model the workflow, and a common way to do that is through visualization. But there may be other ways. Yeah. Um, and then give us the opportunity to then branch out into how you can do those other ways. Right. But yeah, maybe cool. model doesn't yeah. sit well. Model, yeah, I like I like I like some of these other things. Reveal. We'll have to we'll have to get all of your yeah, all of your names yeah. so we can. Um, and maybe we should, we should, if somebody wants to put up a quick poll so we can do, do some, some voting on that. What? Who's, what? I don't know. Thank Sorry. you. Uh, how did the idea spark that you wanted to focus your life and career on these, you know, on the full flow metrics? And I guess what was the moment that made you go, enough? I don't know if I'm drunk enough to tell that story. Um, <laughs> but I can do it at a high level, maybe. I don't, I, the first part is fixable. <laughs> <laughs> um, as, as a development manager, I got sick and tired of being asked questions that I couldn't answer. And the tools that I had available weren't helping me. In fact, they were making things worse. Um, and there were certain, certain individuals that were reinforcing that. But I guess I don't necessarily want to get, get any names or anything like that. But uh, yeah, I, I was just extremely frustrated that 
You know, I was constantly, I was over and over and over, I was asked the same, everybody knows this, and I say this all the time. When you start working on something for your customers, what's the first question they're gonna ask you? When will it be done? When will it be done? <laughs> and you think about all the tools in Agile or RUP before it or, you know, what, you know whatever, the, you know, none of that is, is really, really geared toward effectively being able to answer that question. So I figured there had to be a better way. Uh, and lo and behold, there is, you know, 80 years of queuing theory <laughs> out there that has really kind of answered this question for us. Yeah, well, software is not the first time this question has been asked. <laughs> this question has been asked over and over again, and there is a body of knowledge out there that helps us answer it, which is, yeah, queuing theory and flow and Kanban is just natural at that point. And, and by the way, I don't, I w it wouldn't surprise me if 20 years from now, hopefully we're doing Drunk Agile 20 years from now, and you know, we, we probably learn some more, and maybe there's, there's a better way to do this. There's, that would not surprise me. In fact, I'd be kind of shocked if that didn't happen. Story points. No. <laughs> be because math. Because math. Because math. Can I suggest making the workflow accessible? Workflow accessible. Yeah. Accessibilize. Is that English? Accessibilize. <laughs> and are there any other Americans in the room? Because you, you, any? Are there no other Americans in the room? Thank God. <laughs> You're Swedish. <laughs> <laughs> a couple in the back heckling. Yeah, actually, there's an American right here. Yeah. Um, accessibilize. I'm going to go with accessibilize. Play, play fast and loose with the queen. With, with an S. With an S. With an S. With a Z. Z. Yeah. Okay, any more questions? Provocative questions, this, uh, there's gotta be. There's one. Oh, oh wait, is that? Oh, Bristol? Bristol, there's a bridge. There's a bridge. <laughs> um, uh, how do you feel about refinement? What? Sorry, I didn't hear. Refinement, how do you feel about refinement? Oh, <laughs> should refinement be an event in Scrum? What is refinement? <laughs> to me, refinement is taking something big and breaking it down into small pieces. That's what refinement is. Take a big problem and, oh, this is too big for us to deal with right now, let's break it down to small pieces. You should do that early and you should do that often. In fact, don't do it early, only do it often. Um, it doesn't require an event. It doesn't require the item to have not started. Just whenever you realize something is aging, Something is too big for us to solve in a reasonable amount of time. Let's break it up into smaller problems and start solving them. Um, that's my understanding of refinement. I don't know if there's another definition of refinement, but that's my understanding of refinement. I kind of understand it better, but yeah. I mean, to me, uh, not that we're necessarily saying make, make it a Scrum event, but I mean, why, why isn't developing a Scrum event? Why isn't testing a Scrum event? Why isn't you know, uh, re, um, getting feedback. Your, yeah, user acceptance, you know, a, a Scrum event, so. Uh, um, is, is there necessarily, a, you know, uh, an act of refinement? You know, absolutely, but it should be done, uh, as we said, kind of just in time and, uh, and as often as possible. Some may say that um, flow metrics is from the old vanguard of, um, stability, predictability of manufacturing. What would you kind of focus on as an alternative? What do you think is the next step from the Monte Carlos and all that cool stuff? What's next? I mean, in, in terms of, uh in terms of what ne what what's next from a predictability or stability perspective, or what's next from a what should Agile be solving perspective? What should Agile be solving? I don't, for me, I don't know that Agile's really solved, um, Colleen, cover your ears. Um, I don't know that, that Agile has solved the whole financial side of things. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm surprised that, that there's, there's not a better answer. I, I say this all the time. I think, I think that 80% of corporate dysfunction comes from accounting practices. Apologies to any accountants in the room. Um, and those accounting practices actually can be tied back to, to tax codes, but you know, now we're getting into political stuff or whatever. But uh, um, and I'm, su I'm surprised, I, from my perspective, Agile's been largely silent on that. I know there's been some really interesting stuff with Beyond Budgeting you know, in the past 10 years or whatever that, that has come up. I don't know that, uh, that that's really caught on, but, um, but for me, that's, that, that's kind of the big thing. 
Uh, one back here. A quick one. Uh, I know we talk about uh, forecasting at a team level. What about when you have a team of teams? Often mm -hmm. you'll have you know, your product managers coming in. We've got a feature group of teams. How do we predict or kind of what's that runway? How do we look at our predictability? Um, while Dan's, oh, he pulled it up already. <laughs> while Dan's, Dan's pulling it up, the thing that's hardest to do is to mix systems when you're forecast. The way you do it is by saying, here is the roll-up of our forecasts for all these teams. Team A system delivering one thing, Team B system delivering another. And what you see there, that board, and there is a very similar um, representation uh, in Actionable Agile for JIRA, um, it's a portfolio forecast which says, for Team A, we can get it done with this probability. Team B, we can get it done for this, with this probability. You can essentially, what, what it is, is a, a roll-up of the individual forecasts. <laughs> it is with a caveat that it is a roll up of epics and versions for a single team, but yeah. it's not yet rolling up forecasts for each project in Jira. So, so it's, it's there for a single team, uh, but it, uh, for multiple epics on a single team, it's not necessarily there for multiple teams yet. Um, but yeah, that, the way you would do it is, is exactly the same. Hey, let's do, let's do a team forecast and then roll it up into multiple teams. The thing that will make it fail almost 100% of the time is if you're splitting value delivery across multiple teams. Could you, could you expand on that? If you have a single piece of value that you need to deliver, but three teams need to work on it separately in order to deliver it, and they run their own systems, no forecasting is going to help you there. It's a system problem that we need to fix. That, that, that at that point is not a forecasting problem, it's a coaching problem. Time for, time for maybe one more. We to, are we done at 5.15? Yep. One more? Yeah. Okay, one more, please. One more. Not from the Canadian. Again, I know, sorry. Um, uh, answering that question, when is it gonna be done? Have you worked in environments where really what they're asking is how much is it gonna cost? What, is that a different, um, is that, are there environments you've worked in where that's a different, that's a different question? It, 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 is, it, it is and it isn't. It's a different question, but um, how much is it going to cost is almost always a function of when will it be done. So I, I would say it's, it's impossible. We should never say impossible. We don't, mm. yeah, we don't, never 100%, right? But it's much harder to answer how much is it going to cost without knowing when will it be done. Um, and then usually what, you know, when you're, well, you know, this, uh, as you're answering that, when will it be done, that's, that's when those other, you know, kind of more traditional project management techniques come in, is, you know, can we cut scope? Can we, God forbid, add people? Can we, God forbid, start working overtime? Can we even more, God forbid, do all of that, all of that stuff together? Yeah. Um, and, and, and the further away those two answers are, the answer to when will it be done and how much will it cost, the more there are things you could probably improve in the system to bring those two answers together. Because I think it goes back to the same problem of, hey, but 20% of that team is working on this and 30% of that team is working on this, as opposed to why can't have, we have, have 100% one, of one team working on this. Um, for, oh, one more, one more, okay, yeah. Yes, the final question. Um, I'll do my best. Um, what do you do if, if for an organization flow is not their biggest challenge? Do you think that in some cases, very experienced cases, where the focus on process and flow can do more damage to the organization on longer time because they avoid the harder, difficulter discussions? Uh, yeah, m m most definitely. I, I'm <laughs> we wait until the very end to be provocative. Because we only have one minute left, that's how, um, the way I'm going to answer that question is, that's what you're saying right there is the biggest reason why I'm against theory of constraints. Me personally, me personally, that's why I'm against theory of constraints because I think it's solving the wrong problem. I think it actually make, makes things worse, um, you know, ra rather than than making things things better. So I'll leave it at that. Um, <laughs> I need okay, to. Okay. We're gonna get kneecapped. <laughs> Were you gonna? Yeah, I was just gonna add to that. Is most progress in those kind of environments is made via negativa by removing things, not by adding things. It's the, Latin again. Yeah, it's the it's the old thing of. Um, 
David was already there. Michelangelo just removed the extra parts. <laughs> so uh, for, for Pratik Singh, for Nisha, who is no longer on the screen, just want to say thanks, everybody, for joining us on this, this episode of Drunk Agile. Uh, thanks for having a drink. Cheers, everybody. See you, uh, see you in the next episode.